Boston, June 1775. Situated on a peninsula, it was largely protected from close approach by expanses of water surrounding it which were dominated by British warships. In the aftermath of the battles of Lexington and Concord on April 19, 1775, the colonial militia, a force of about 15,000 men, had surrounded the town and effectively besieged it. Under the command of Artemis Ward, they controlled the only land access to Boston itself, that being the Roxbury Neck, but, lacking a navy, were unable to contest the British domination of the harbor waters. While the recent British retreat from Concord had ended in Charlestown, rather than immediately fortifying the hills on the peninsula, General Gage had withdrawn those troops to Boston the day after the battle, essentially turning the entire Charlestown Peninsula into a no-man's land. At this point, Gage found himself blockaded in Boston by the American Continental Army occupying the hills to the west of the city. He resolved to seize the Charlestown Peninsula across the harbor. The Crown had sent three generals to assist General Gage, William Howe, John Burgoyne, and Henry Clinton. General Howe would assume command for the upcoming battle. General Howe outlined the plan for attack, according to the book, Decisive Day, The Battle for Bunker Hill. Quote, General Howe outlined the plan in a letter written on June 12 to his brother, the Admiral. First, a detachment would move out against the Dorster Neck, throw up two redoubts there, and then attack the Rover Post in Roxbury. Once Boston was safe from attack in that direction, Howe would take a large force to Charlestown Heights and attack either the Americans in Cambridge or outflank that post, which would accomplish the same purpose. The attack was set for June 18th." End quote. British units at the Battle of Bunker Hill consisted of 3,000 troops composed from the Grenadiers and Light Companies of the 4th, 10th, 18th, 22nd, 23rd, 35th, 59th, 63rd, and 65th regiments of foot, as well as detachments of Marines from the fleet. They were under the command of Sir William Howe, Sir Robert Pigeot, James Abercrombie, John Pitcairn, Henry Clinton, Samuel Graves, and Thomas Gage. American units were made up of militia totaling approximately 2,400 men under the command of Israel Putnam, William Prescott, John Stark, and Dr. Joseph Warren. On June 13, 1775, the leaders of the colonial forces besieging Boston learned that the British were planning to send troops out from the city to fortify the unoccupied hills surrounding the city, which would give them control of the harbor. In response, 1,200 colonial troops under the command of William Prescott quietly moved to occupy Bunker Hill and Breed's Hill. During the night, the colonists constructed a strong redoubt on Breed's Hill, as well as a smaller, fortified line across the Charlestown Peninsula. The main fortification was square in shape and about 130 feet 40 meters on a side with ditches and earthen walls. The walls of the redoubt itself were 6 feet 1.8 meters high with a wooden platform inside on which men could stand and fire over the walls. As the sun rose, Prescott became aware of a significant problem with the location of the redoubt. It could easily be flanked on either side. He promptly ordered his men to begin constructing a breastwork running down the hill to the east, deciding he did not have the manpower to also build additional defenses to the west. Earlier that night, while on reconnaissance, General Clinton took notice of the work being done on Breed's Hill and tried to convince Generals Gage and Howe that they needed to prepare to attack the position at daylight. In the early pre-dawn, around 4 a.m., a sentry on board HMS Lively spotted the new fortification and notifying her captain, the Lively opened fire temporarily halting the work. Aboard the flagship HMS Somerset, Admiral Samuel Graves proceeded to halt the unordered gunfire, only to be countermanded by General Gage, who once he became fully aware of the situation, ordered all 128 guns in the harbor, as well as the batteries atop Copse Hill in Boston, to fire on the colonial position, which had relatively little effect. When the British generals met to discuss their options, General Clinton, who had urged an attack as early as possible, preferred an attack beginning from the Charlestown Neck that would cut off the colonists' retreat, reducing the process of capturing the new redoubt to one of starving out its occupants. However, he was outvoted by the other three generals. How? who was the senior officer present and would also lead the assault, was of the opinion that the hill was open and easy of ascent and, in short, would be easily carried. General Burgoyne concurred, arguing that, quote-unquote, untrained rep would be no match for their trained troops. Orders were then issued to prepare the expedition. 
It took six hours for the British to organize an infantry force and to gather up and inspect the men on parade. General Howe was to lead the major assault, drive around the colonial left flank, and then take them from the rear. Brigadier General Robert Pigeot on the British left flank would lead the direct assault on the redoubt, and Major John Pitcairn to lead the flank or reserve force. It took several trips and longboats to transport Howe's initial forces, consisting of about 1,500 men, to the eastern corner of the peninsula known as Moulton's Point. By 2 p.m., Howe's chosen force had been landed. Seeing the British preparations, Prescott called for reinforcements. Prescott ordered Connecticut men under Captain Nowelton to defend the left flank, where they used a crude dirt wall as a breastwork and topped it with fence rails and hay. They also constructed three small V-shaped trenches between this dirt wall and Prescott's breastwork. Troops that arrived to reinforce this flank position included about 200 men from the 1st and 3rd New Hampshire regiments under Colonels John Stark and James Reed. Stark's men, who did not arrive until after Howe landed his forces and thus filled a gap in the defense that Howe could have taken advantage of had he attacked sooner, took positions along the breastwork on the northern end of the colonial position. When the low tide opened a gap among the Mystic River to the north, they quickly extended the fence with a short stone wall to the water's edge. At 3 p.m., the British 47th Foot and the 1st Marines arrived, and the British were now ready to march. Brigadier General Pigeot's force, gathering just south of Charlestown Village, began taking casualties from sniper fire, and Howe asked General Graves for assistance in clearing out the snipers. Graves, who had planned for such a possibility, ordered incendiary shot fired into the village and then sent a landing party to set fire to the town. General Howe led the light infantry companies and grenadiers in the assault on the American left flank, expecting an easy effort against Stark's recently arrived troops. His light infantry were set along the narrow beach in column in order to turn the far left flank of the colonial position. The grenadiers were deployed in the middle. They lined up four deep and several hundred across. When the regulars closed within range, both sides opened fire. The colonists inflicted heavy casualties on the regulars, using the fence to steady and aim their muskets and benefit from their modicum of cover. With this devastating barrage of musket fire, the regulars retreated in disarray and the militia held their ground. The regulars reformed on the field and marched out again. This time, Pigeot was not to faint. He was to assault the redoubt, possibly without the assistance of Howe's force. Howe, instead of marching against Stark's position along the beach, marched instead against Knowlton's position along the rail fence. The outcome of the second attack was the same as the first. One British observer wrote, quote, Most of our grenadiers and light infantry, the moment of presenting themselves, lost three-fourths and many nine-tenths of their men. Some had only eight or nine men a company left, End quote. Pigeot did not fare any better in his attack on the redoubt and again ordered a retreat. General Howe, deciding that he would try again, sent word to General Clinton in Boston for additional troops. Clinton, who had watched the first two attacks, sent about 400 men from the 2nd Marines and the 63rd Foot, and then followed himself to help rally the troops. In addition to the new reserves, he also convinced about 200 of the wounded to form up for the third attack. During the interval between the second and third assaults, General Putnam continued trying to direct troops towards the action. Some companies, and leaderless groups of men, moved towards the action. Others retreated. The third assault, concentrated on the redoubt, with only a feint on the colonists' flank, was successful, although the colonists again poured musket fire into the British ranks and it cost the life of Major Pitcairn. The defenders had run out of ammunition, reducing the battle to close combat. The British had the advantage once they entered the redoubt as their troops were equipped with bayonets on their muskets, while most of the colonists were not. It is during the retreat from their doubt that Joseph Warren was killed. Most of the prisoners taken by the British were mortally wounded. General Putnam attempted to reform the troops on Bunker Hill. However, the flight of the colonial forces was so rapid that artillery pieces and entrenching tools had to be abandoned. The colonists suffered most of their casualties during the retreat. By 5 p.m., the colonists had retreated over the Charlestown Neck to fortified positions in Cambridge, and the British were in control of the peninsula. The British suffered 1,054 casualties comprised of 226 dead and 828 wounded, with a disproportionate number of these being officers. The casualty count was the highest suffered by the British in any single encounter during the entire war. General Clinton, echoing Pyrrhus of Epirus, remarked in his diary that, quote, 
A few more such victories would have shortly put an end to British dominion in America. End quote. The dead and wounded officers comprised a significant portion of the British officer corps in North America at the time. Colonial losses were about 450 men, of whom 140 were killed. Most of the colonial losses came during the withdrawal. Two noteworthy casualties were Major Andrew McClary, the highest ranking colonial officer to die in the battle. He was hit by cannon fire on the Charlestown Neck and the last person to be killed in the battle, and Dr. Joseph Warren, who died during combat. He had only been appointed a major general just three days prior, though his commission had not yet taken effect when the battle began. Only 30 men were captured by the British, most of them with grievous wounds. 20 died while held prisoner. The battle was a tactical, though somewhat pirate, victory for the British, as it proved to be a sobering experience for them involving many more casualties than the Americans had incurred, including a large number of officers. The battle had demonstrated that inexperienced militia were able to stand up to regular army troops in battle. Subsequently, the battle discouraged the British from any further frontal attacks against well-defended front lines. American casualties were comparatively much fewer, although their losses included General Joseph Warren and Major Andrew McClary, the final casualty of the battle. The British were still trapped inside the city, but were eventually forced to leave Boston the following year in March of 1776 after the Battle of Dorster Heights. The battle also led the British to adopt a more cautious planning and maneuver execution in future engagements, which was evident in the subsequent New York and New Jersey campaign and arguably helped rather than hindered the American forces. Their new approach to battle was actually giving the Americans greater opportunity to retreat if defeat was imminent. The costly engagement also convinced the British of the need to hire substantial numbers of Hessian auxiliaries to bolster their strength in the face of the new and formidable Continental Army. Yet another casualty of the battle was General Thomas Gage's military career. Gage was the commander of the British troops in Boston at the time and had ordered the assault on Breed's Hill. When he later called for more British troops to be sent to Boston after the battle, the British government turned against him according to the book Decisive Day, The Battle of Bunker Hill. Quote, the public and the government wanted a scapegoat and the first person they thought of was Gage himself. Here he was calling for more troops, implying that the government had been responsible for the failures in America. It was obvious that the man who George III called the Mile General had to go. Three days after the news of Bunker Hill reached London, the decision was made to dismiss Gage and replace him with William Howe. End quote. Thanks for watching this installment of The Chronicler's Tale. Be sure to like and subscribe to be notified of new content. You can also follow the channel on the social media platforms listed in the video notes below. Enjoy, and be well, everyone. Talk to you soon.